Hello everyone, Nightmare here, and this is Whale FM's Fireside Chat with Artist. In this show, we talk about everything and anything art and crypto in the NFT scene with designers and creators alike, otherwise known as non-fungible tokens. My guest today is Karen Jerzyk, the New England-based fine art photographer who juxtaposes relics of the past with vivid fantasy to take viewers on a cathartic journey between nightmare and dreamscape. Karen, super psyched to have you on with us today. Yeah, thank you. Thanks for having me. I'm also excited I got to slip Nightmare in there uh, in the intro, which is a rare occurrence <laughs> yeah. for me. Yeah, perfect. Um, so, well, first of all, I actually I came across your photography on Twitter, and I don't remember exactly what I was looking at when it was referenced, but also saw that you were involved in creating NFTs as well. So like I do with a lot of people, started looking at your work and was absolutely blown away that what you do is practical effects photography. Um, just some of the some of the dopest work I have ever seen. So I was really excited to reach out and uh, see if you come join us and, and we're psyched to have you. Thank you. Um, I guess, you know, to kind of ground people, could you just tell us a little bit about yourself and walk us through your background in photography and art? Yeah, sure. So um, I'm Karen. Hi, everybody. Um, so I was always kind of creative, like growing up as a kid. Um, my mother would bring me to the movies a lot and um, movies, museums, the library. And I think a lot of that kind of like stuck with me. Um, so I was born in 1981. I'm going to be 40 in June, which I can't believe. <laughs> um, so I grew up watching like a lot of sci-fi movies. Um, a lot of movies that still weren't really using CGI and stuff. So like, you know, like Labyrinth, Goonies, um, Close Encounters of the Third Kind. I, I can go on and on, but like for some reason, those movies like always really stuck with me. Um, even watching them now, I still get like that same feeling that I got when I watched them when I was a kid. So um for a while, when I was younger, I I would do like stop animation videos and I really wanted to be a videographer just because movies was always like my, my number one inspiration and um, life kind of happened and back when I was going to college, I, I couldn't really afford going to film school so I ended up getting my BA in English and um, while I was in college, I got really into like going to concerts. And um, so I'd go to concerts, like I'd go to like a couple of concerts a week. And hey, Lavelli, <laughs> I just saw Lavelli pop in. Um, so I, I went to a lot of concerts and I would like sneak a camera in to take pictures. And I don't know why I was doing that. I think it was, you know, I was younger. So I was like, oh, look how close I got to this band. <laughs> like I was in the front row. And um, that actually equated to me building a music portfolio. Um, so I actually started getting like photo passes. I, I started kind of like shooting at like local venues, like dive bar type things. It was mostly like metal and like hardcore music. And um, so yeah, I built a portfolio and I started shooting at like bigger venues. Um, I shot, I ended up shooting like over the years, like Kiss, Metallica, Aerosmith, um, which is kind of crazy. And after a while I got kind of like bored with it. Um, it just creatively it wasn't really what i was looking to do and around 2009 um one of my friends was like why don't you start shooting portraits and i'm like really introverted and the thought of like directing someone <laughs> seemed like just like terrifying to me um but i did it anyway and like it, it's crazy to look at my portfolio back then because it was so horrible. Like I just, I didn't have any, you know, I, I never went to school for photography. So like I went from shooting mostly concerts to, wow, now I need to learn lighting. And now there's like a person I'm directing and I need to pay attention to wardrobe and locations. And, um, so back then, like, I really wasn't interested in getting a studio for myself. So I'd kind of just like meet up with people and shoot anywhere. And 
I was looking through, I, I just, I do a lot of like internet searching. Like I go through that wormhole of like, I'll look for one thing and then like five hours later, <laughs> I'm looking at something at the complete end of the spectrum from where I started. So I somehow found pictures of an abandoned hospital um, that was attached to uh, an abandoned theater that was attached to a hospital um, in Norwich, Connecticut. And I was just like, what is this? Like, I never considered at that point that places like that existed. Never saw pictures of places like that. Never thought about it. Um, so I saw the picture and I was like, I need to go there. I, I don't know why. I just like had to go there. So I went and that started like, I guess what I would call my <laughs> trespassing career. And um, so I was shooting like at a lot of abandoned houses, hospitals, all these weird places. And um, in 2011, um, my father passed away really unexpectedly. And uh, that really changed a lot for me um, because before then for the couple of years I was shooting portraits I guess like aesthetically they kind of looked cool but they weren't my my images weren't really telling a story they didn't really have any feeling and then I was really close to my father so I had a really hard time with it and um you know I I I think when someone passes away and you have friends and family that aren't really they haven't gone through that before it's kind of like a taboo thing to talk about so I was really struggling with, I needed someone to confide in, I needed people to talk to and people would just kind of like brush me off. And um, I just reached like a really, really low point in my life, um, se severe depression. I was at a job that I absolutely hated. It was just, it was the worst. And I just poured myself into my photography um just to keep my mind off everything really it, it was more of an escape and the more i did that the more my images started to kind of tell stories and the more i noticed i was connecting with people which is what i wanted to do um i just i just needed people to connect with you know kind of like like therapy and um after a while, like mentally, I, I started to feel better and but I, I kind of like harnessed that that need to still connect with people and that need to still be able to tell a story um, with imagery. And um, I guess that's pretty much where I am today. Um, I do have a studio now. It's actually behind me. I'm like building. I don't know if you can see that old duck. <laughs> There you go. Um, kind of looks like a, a grandmother's kitchen. Well, I've been posting like updates about this and like, people were like, I could smell the cigarette smoke just by looking at that, which is funny because I, I guess that's kind of the look I'm going for. But um, yeah, so right now I do kind of like half abandoned stuff um, and half set building at my studio. Um I don't know how far you want me to get into the story, but I started set building because in 2014 I got busted pretty bad for trespassing. <laughs> and like, I yeah, had yeah, I had seen that actually, and and, and yeah. it's funny because in some of the prep for this, I'm like, let me get all these links ready because I definitely want to share. And I'm like, you know what? Maybe a mugshot's not the best one to throw up there, you know? <laughs> yeah. Although it is kind of a badge of honor. Uh, uh, but yeah. I <laughs> but, but before before we get to that, because you, you, there's so much interesting stuff right there, um, I got to rewind it a little bit. Full disclosure, part of my fanboyism is I'm actually a Massachusetts native, so I started recognizing some North Shore and New Hampshire like oh, locations okay. in some of the pictures or whatever. And then yeah. I'm like, wait a minute, this is California. This is this is all across the United States at different places. So this is cool. So that was part of it. Um, but one thing I had to throw out there when you started talking about a lot of your inspiration from when you were young, uh, when you were talking about Labyrinth and the Dark Crystal and things of that nature. Man, I'm so upset that they canceled uh, that on Netflix because they did a really, really I good know. job. Yeah, It was amazing. And the puppetry with Henson was just, it was so cool what they did. So I'm really disappointed they didn't move forward with that. But you're right. It does, 
those practical effects make such a difference, at least to me, in making it seem more magical and authentic, like you're there and that you're actually yeah. part of it. You know, it's 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 real and it just hits different. You can tell when you look at CGI and there's talented applications of it and and a lot of different things in art and photography and, and filmmaking, but it just you know, and maybe it's because of the era that I grew up in. It just has a different level of authenticity to me. So when I saw your pictures and I had to give it a few looks like is this literally a set mate like how is this thing floating like it was hard for me to discern there's going to be a lot of effort involved in that so props yeah, to you for putting floating. that together yeah the floating there's a lot of wire or there's a lot of like people jumping or uh there's ways to do it i i it's it's fun to kind of make like a puzzle out of it or kind of like to, to me, it's almost like a math equation, only it's visual. So I'll, I'll think of something and then I'm like, how can I do this physically? Or even like looking, even at like paintings, I like looking at paintings and trying to figure out how I can apply that to the sets I'm building. And the other, the other thing about that too, and I actually had a conversation with someone about this last night. It's like n totally not to downplay people that do, you know, CGI and rendering and all that because, you know, that's another amazing form of art. Um, it's just for me, there's a whole other thing that people don't see. And I guess it's just for me is that when I take photos of people when they walk in to the studio and they like see the set just their reaction is usually priceless to me and it just you know it just lasts for that moment um i don't know why it's so important for me to like get that moment because like no one else shares it no one sees that you know it's just like me and the person i'm taking the picture of but it's it's yeah it's yeah to me that's like 50 percent of the reward that's just so fleeting and doesn't last is like yeah the person coming in and being like oh my god this is amazing like this right. is shooting in i can't believe it so yeah it's yeah. and and the other thing is like i think I, you know it's another thing that's impressive to me is there's such detail there's such attention paid to texture and to color and even thematically like it feels like there's a juxtaposition of like old and new you know what i mean like there's a lot of stuff that that seems to be frozen in time um references to like a day's past like it stood still yet there's this different life happening around it i could be way off but at least, you know art subjective no, but when no, i yeah you're definitely it's funny because i i did this music video for a band uh baroness uh back in 2015 or 16 and um me and the singer were kind of like talking about that and he was like your stuff is really like future past and i was like i love that like i never up until that point i never really thought about it um but yeah and again that's kind of going back to like the 80s where like the 80s still had you know in people's houses they still had furniture from the 50s 60s 70s depending on if they updated it or not but like Look at like, str you know, Stranger Things, like the set design in that, like everyone's houses. I, I love that series just for that. Like even if the storyline sucked, I would still watch it because visually it's amazing. But it's like the 80s was kind of like that where it was like still you had like the old furniture in your friend's houses and you knew that friend that had like that grandmother that like... You know, still, like, she hasn't updated her house since, like, the 40s or 50s. But then you also had, like, that kind of, that, like, wave in technology where everything was, like, coming up. I feel like we're kind of, like, back in that again, actually. Um, you know, with uh, it's, like, just new technology that everyone's, like, excited about. And it's, yeah, yeah. It's it, I, I try to, like, mesh the two together, I guess. It just feels right to me and i again i think it's because that's kind of what i grew up with um it, you know when you're a kid and you're growing up in that it's so like deeply embedded into you i think like subconsciously that it just never went away for me yeah super dope i mean this is i feel like it's it's really high level application of 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 a lot of artistic um 
methodologies here. Are you self-taught or did you have any formal education in this? Yeah, so I'm self-taught. Um, that picture that's up on the screen is actually a drone shot with real fire, which uh, <laughs> I melted my shoes putting out because I was like, so, <laughs> so there was like a bunch of leaves and I like raked that circle in the leaves. And um, yeah, I like playing with fire. I always have, which probably isn't a good thing. But, um, but yeah, I'm, I'm self-taught, um, which is hard because when you're self-taught, uh, like I never, I never knew what was out there to even ask, you know? So it was, there was a lot of like stumbling through stuff. Um, even like it's, I find it funny when people ask me about my lighting because everything is like DIY. Like I, I never have like the latest and greatest equipment. I don't even have much equipment. Um, but I like telling people that too, because that, I think that gives people hope that might want to kind of get into it and do the kind of things that I do, I guess, with like, you know, the set building and all that, but they're afraid to because they think maybe there's like a ton of money involved and there's really not like a lot of my props. I just get on like for a while it was Craigslist and now it's like Facebook marketplace. <laughs> and I'm just like, Oh, you're getting rid of this free, uh, huge old refrigerator. I'll take it. So, right. <laughs> I think I think that adds to the authenticity and also, you know, you talk about being self-taught. I and I know the the struggle of that trying to go through and just a basic thing taking you a lot of time to to get down. But by the same token, obviously you become very resourceful and able to, you know, make magic happen. You know, you could walk into a room and you MacGyver it into an amazing set where other people um may have a different, you know, process and workflow. So uh I, you know, I not to say that I'm glad that you had to put in all those extra hours, but certainly the result is amazing. So um, it gave you an amazing skill set that really comes across visually. And did I read this correctly? With with COVID, you've even expanded on uh, the models. Now you're using mannequins, right? You brought in uh, some <laughs> yeah. mannequins to play with. Yeah. So um, yeah, when COVID started, uh, you know, March of 2020, it was just, I think it was all like, we all got punched in the face. It's like, what, like, what am I going to do? I, and, and at the time, like we had just got another studio room. So we actually have like two rooms and that really wasn't in the budget. I, I share my studio with two other photographers. Um, so that really wasn't in the budget in the first place. And then it's like, oh, by the way, here's COVID and like every, you know, I, I vend at a lot of events. That's how I make most of my, uh, my money. So everything got canceled and I was just like, I'm in trouble. <laughs> like, what am I going to do? And I also do like pop-up pop-ups at my studio. Um, so what I would do is like monthly pop-ups and they were all themed. So it was kind of like a photo booth type thing where like, you know, for Halloween, I do like some kind of like spooky set and, um, you know, I do one for Christmas or whatever. I, uh, and I would just do like random ones. Like I did like an Alice in Wonderland one. I did, I'm so bummed. I did a Mario brothers one right March, 2020. So like only a few people got to come and I was bummed about that because I wanted to do that one for so long but but like all that was taken away from me and I was like man like all right well now I gotta rely on selling prints you know either shipping my prints to like galleries that I know or like shops that I know um so I guess it all came down to the fact that <laughs> yeah, there's a Mario set that's my boyfriend um I make him do stuff that he hates, but yeah, um, yeah man, I want to do that again. I'm, I'll probably do another Mario set. Uh, but yeah, so I was like, well, I need to start, I need to keep coming out with images. I, I can't just stop. Like I, you know, that I would be buried if I didn't. I mean, I guess I could have relied on like older stuff, but I had nothing else to do too. Like if I, if I'm not able to create, I'll go insane. And I was terrified of COVID. Um, like I live with my, my mother lives with us. She's 74. So I'm like, Oh my God, I'm going to like accidentally bring this home to her. So I was like really careful. So because I was being super careful, I wasn't taking photos of people. 
So I was like, what am I going to do? Like that, that's what I do. Like I'm not a landscape photographer. I'm not a product photographer. So I bought a bunch of mannequins and, um, I, I would like dress them up, but then I was like looking at like the heads and I'm like, it's just like a blank head and this kind of isn't cool. Like it, j it just looked weird. So then I started making masks and, um, which it, which is, there are some like silver linings from COVID. Like there's a lot of things like that, that I probably wouldn't have done had COVID not been a thing. Um, so the whole mask making and like, like that's an example with the paper bag that, that was actually a mannequin. Um, I don't think I would have been doing that kind of stuff or that would have maybe come way down the line, who right. even knows, but yeah, it, it really forced me to do like different things and kind of like create more than I was already doing. Cause I had all the time in the world. So I wasn't traveling like I normally did and I wasn't vending and i there was a lot of stuff i wasn't doing and i'm sure a lot of people can relate to that so yeah we actually just had a, a question relative to that um someone had asked since you've now adapted to the COVID environment is there anything you think you'll no longer continue to do going forward hmm that's a good question um you know, it's weird because I think about like, you know, right before everything shut down, I was like in New York City shooting because um, I'm, you you know, New England's like right there. Like New, New York City is only like four hours from me. So I, I was doing a lot there and I've been back um, since, which is really weird because I, I, I shot in Times Square and there was absolutely no one there, which is really kind of creepy. But um, I like I think about that and I'm like, man, like I was, you know, taking the subway and like just I think crowds are going to freak me out for a while. Um, and the first vending thing I think I'm going to do this year is in New Orleans in June. And I think I'm going to be kind of worried to do that. Like by then I'm going to have both my vaccines and obviously I'm going to still wear a mask and I'm sure they're going to make, you know, the people coming in wear a mask. But, um, yeah, it's, I think it's going to be rough for me to just kind of like adapt to going out again and being amongst people. Um, but it also, I'm usually horrible with my finances. <laughs> like, admittedly, like, as soon as I, you know, get, so, you know, I get income from something, I put it back into getting props or getting materials. It all goes back into my photography. Um, but with COVID, it actually told me, taught me to, because I didn't know, like, when my next payments for anything were coming in. And I, I got really lucky with, like, print sales and different projects that I did kind of, like, remotely for people. Um, but it definitely, it, it taught me how to be more resourceful with what I already have and how to shoot smarter um, and not harder in terms of even like my set building, um, for a while, instead of building these gigantic sets, which I love doing again, I love when people walk in and it's a huge, you know, life-size set, but actually that right there is an example of what I'm talking about. That's perfect. So, um, that is actually just the front part is a piece of cardboard that's a dollar at the dollar store and I cut that square hole in it. So I did like a lot of force perspective sets. So instead of spending like a couple hundred dollars on like this huge front piece, um, I did like that force perspective where that piece of cardboard was like next to my camera and I shot through the hole and I had someone sitting there with that, that head that I made. So I was doing more stuff like that kind of out of necessity. I, I had to because I, I couldn't afford um, pretty much all of 2020. I couldn't afford to make the sets that I usually build. So, um, so I think, you know, like a practice like that is something I would like to hold on to. Um, it also allows to do kind of like more surreal, like quirky type stuff, like what's on the screen. So yeah, that, that's definitely something I would love to do moving forward. And obviously like still making the masks and, you know, 
with mannequins, you can do a lot. You can hang them from the ceiling and like from the rafters and whatever. Um, right. My studio is in a really old mill building, so like I can like you know hang some stuff from the ceiling and no one cares. So yeah, yeah. And I'm sure that lends itself to some you know uh, almost emotiveness having the lifeless kind of mannequin right you can manipulate that a little bit um but that brings me to another thought i had you know when i look at your photography and the stuff that you put together um like you said there's definitely an, an exploration of emotion in in what you're doing and in this photography it's almost like an amplification of different feelings and you mentioned when your father passed and it was almost cathartic for you to kind of submerge yourself right in into photography and start um, kind of conveying, exploring some of these emotions and in internal struggles. I just wonder if you could talk a little bit more about that because I find that fascinating um, when we talk about art, how people can take a moment and encapsulate it and then actually go inside of it and explore the far reaches of it. Not necessarily just what you feel, but you can sometimes encapsulate other things and, and, and explore it while you're in the medium um mm. beyond your own experiences it's almost transformative in my opinion but you definitely do it really really well and it comes across in your photography thanks yeah i i mean i have to say i i always my heart goes out to anyone that you know has mental health issues or they've lost someone or just whatever anyone just struggling mentally and they don't have an outlet um i think about that often and I, I just find myself so, so lucky that I had that outlet because had I not, I can't, I can't even fathom where I'd be if I would be here right now. Um, but yeah, it's, it's, it, it's scary that when you go through that and, you know, I, I had never lost someone that close to me before. Um, you know, obviously losing a parent is, you know, pretty pretty serious and um it, it was yeah it was very suddenly um he had had a heart attack and we we didn't know that um he was just feeling sick and um the heart attack had caused a blood clot and he had a stroke and you know the the paramedics came and they kind of like kept him alive like you know on, on a machine um, so on top of all this, like, I'm an only child. So my, you know, talk about like not wanting to be an only child. Like everyone's like, oh, you must've been so lucky growing up. But it's like, I never wanted, like never wished that I had had a sibling more than around that time. It was just like, it was pretty terrible. So like my mother and I had to make the decision to take him off life support. And it was just, it, it was like, I was watching a movie about myself and I was like kind of watching everything happen from the back of my own head like looking up it was so weird um and I remember someone I knew that had lost his father he was like you know remember to eat dinner remember to all this stuff and I'm thinking what is that's a weird thing to say to me like I, I don't I, I don't get and I understood like after like in hindsight why he said that because it's like you go on this strange autopilot almost kind of like a as a defense mechanism um yeah it was like a weird auto like the the year after my father died i i always you know someone references a movie or something to me and i'm like i don't remember seeing that and they're like yeah we watched that and i was like when was that was that and if it, it's you i have like this whole like year where i don't remember anything after he died because it was like just a weird trauma that my i i couldn't um like uh, my brain and my body couldn't really just die right or like deal with um so i i think that's very important to kind of you know i look back on all the things i should have done like i probably should have went to therapy or you know spoke to a professional or something because i just i i didn't it, it was weird i i was like numb to everything um and then you know luckily i kind of like wrangled that and I kind of understood what was going on with myself and um 
you know, when you, when you deal with stuff like that, I don't feel like it ever goes away. I, it's just, you have to learn how to manage it. And I'd written this blog about it years ago. Um, and I, I kind of figured it out for myself that as soon as my fire father died, it was like this thing was born. Like it was this grief um, but it was like a child. It was like something that I had to take care of. It's always going to be there. It's never going to go away. Um, you know, and it, it, for that to, for that to go away, I feel like I would forget my thought. You know what I mean? It's like, you can't, you can't have one go away and then still remember, you know, your loved one who's passed or what you've been through in life or whatever. So I kind of, you know, for myself, I, like I said, I deal with it. Like it's a child. I have to be careful with it. I have to manage it. I have to make sure like I nourish it in certain ways and that it doesn't get out of control. And, um, so that's, you know, through the years I've learned to kind of like channel that into what I'm doing with my art visually. So, um, and, you know, like I, I, I have a good sense of humor too. Like I'm not all like, you know, doom and gloom over here. So I think too, that's kind of why my photos kind of run the, run the gamut of like, you know, th the spectrum of, you know, kind of like really low and then really high and everything in between. And, um, I, I think it's important too, to explore that, um, and it's, I do it for me, you know, at the end of the day, like, I love that people enjoy my work and I love that this is what I do for a living. Um, but I do it for myself. I mean, I, I have to, again, because this is something, you know, I'm always gonna, I'm always gonna live with, um, you know, in terms of just like struggling with mental health and depression and stuff like that. So, um, right. yeah, but you, you do it, you do it powerfully. Um, and it definitely evokes emotion when you look at it. And I think that that's, that's the greatest feeling when you're an artist is knowing that someone feels something. I think the, you know, the antithesis of that is when people have apathy and apathetic, when they look at something, it's neither here nor there. And as soon as I saw your work, I was really, I was down the wormhole. I mean, I was there for like an hour and my wife asked what I was doing, right? Like it's, it was hard to stop. And I was going on this journey with you. So you channel it powerfully. Um, but to that, to that end, how would you characterize your creative voice? Because I've seen people call it dark fairy tale imagery and, and, you know, you have the focus on abandoned places. And I think I saw a quote where you talked about the, the decaying structure that you use almost becoming characters along with the people with, within the, the imagery and the beauty and the dismay and pain and suffering. How would you characterize your creative voice? Yeah. Um, Oh, that's a good question. Um, yeah, so I definitely, I, the character and the environment definitely have to fit together. Um, and like you said, I mean, it's, it's not always dark. I feel like I do have some sort of humor, um, in what I do, but I think I really just like to take everyday life and, make it seem surreal or make it seem like those moments that were like, man, is this happening? <laughs> like, you right. know what I mean? It's, um, and that, again, that's why it's important to me to, to do all practical effects and go to real places, um, to kind of show people that, that, you know, I guess the world is kind of what you make of it or the world is how, even how people treat you. Um, you know, you could, you could be in your favorite place and someone does something terrible to you and that place doesn't look so great anymore. It's just, it, I guess, psychological um, aspects really kind of, I like playing with that. Um, I don't really understand it myself, but I, I know it's, I know it's a thing. I know that 
I know that feelings and, you know, like what you feel and what you see and where you are just has this whole weird relationship with each other. Like, it's kind of like when you smell something from your childhood or you see something from, you know, somewhere you went on vacation or it gives you that certain feeling. Um, and I think it's such a complex you know relationship between all these things and that's i think too that's why i never really you know don't have any ideas is because there's it, there's millions of different combinations i think um yeah that that's a video i did at my studio um very cool you have these recurring characters right the astronaut the cat the robot um do they have particular meaning or those, those were just ones that you, you know, you really liked when they were created and wanted to put them in different environments? Yeah. So the astronaut, that's, that's kind of strange because I started doing that series in 2017 and, um, I, I came up with that. I did. I always love anything to do with like space exploration. Obviously, like I said, I'm a sci-fi fan. So that kind of, goes hand in hand and I've always wanted to do something with an astronaut and um so I actually bought a legit high altitude suit it's a vintage one from I think it's from like 1964 and um I I started doing that series in 2017 and I did it because I just kind of like had this thought or this idea of like, man, like what if, what if someday, and I, I had this idea while I was in an abandoned house. So I kind of thought how it's like, here I am coming into this abandoned house that looks like someone just up and left, like in the sixties, all their stuff is still here. Just everything's still there, their clothes, their paperwork, their furniture, their toys. Um, and I kind of saw that as me exploring the past. But I was like, what if one day just humanity in general can't live on Earth anymore for whatever reason? And of course, like one of it, w one of my thoughts was like, we can't breathe the air or like just environmental problems. And so I kind of got that idea of like, you know, we all live on another planet. Maybe we've just completely like colonized Mars or something. And someone decides to come back, just like I decide to go into like these old houses to look around because I'm genuinely curious. I, I don't know what it is that draws me to that kind of stuff, but I mean, other people do it too. So there's, there's some kind of draw to that, you know, to like exploring how people used to live. So yeah, I thought of like this astronaut coming back down to earth and being the only person to kind of just be, you know, just quietly by themselves, just looking around to see how we all lived at one point. And, um, it's strange because then, you know, 2020 came along and I, I had a lot of good luck with that series before, but like 2020 came along and it, like so many people it just, resonated with those images because it was it was like isolation it was you know no one on the street no one anywhere so that that was just really strange how that kind of worked out and um so yeah that i mean that's something i always wanted to want to work with i think that astronaut series is probably going to be like ongoing <laughs> i'm for people are going to be sick of it i'm going to keep doing it but yeah, then like I thought of like the robot, um, and I kind of I kind of got that from like the old like Japanese robot toys. Um, I kind of made it like look rusty, and uh, that's actually my boyfriend in the suit <laughs> again. We took a we took a road trip from so we went from Manchester, New Hampshire, all the way through to Idaho and back again. We did like this huge loop and um, I just found like all these different places. I spend a lot of time on the internet researching locations. So I found like, yeah, like something ridiculous, like like 
five locations or more in like each state and we'd pull over we'd put the suit on really quick it's funny because we at some places there was people there and they would like <laughs> want cell phone shots with him i was like hey he can't see by the way like there's no eye holes for it so like, <laughs> like hey uh by the way there, there's someone standing next to you they want a picture and he's just like whatever he's a good sport <laughs> i'm lucky to have him so but yeah, I, I just, yeah, I think I just like characters. It's not, it, I think back in the day, like, uh, when after my father passed, like, I was doing a lot of, like, I did a lot of kind of, like, new, like, fine art nude type stuff. And I, I think that said a lot, said a lot about, like, my emotional state back then. Um, and then, yeah, I think I just go, like, through these phases where however I feel or whatever is what I need to portray. So I'm, I'm in this, I don't know why I'm just in this, like, I need to do characters phase. I just really like making up characters and kind of going with it. And like the robots, a one and done thing. And like the cat is, I'll probably do a few more pictures with that. And then I don't know. I, I keep wanting to do another robot though. I don't know why <laughs> I like robots. It is a sweet robot. It reminds me of an old Godzilla <laughs> flick, actually. Yeah. I should uh, make a Godzilla costume. I actually, I was considering that and making like a set of like little like houses or something. So I might do that at some point. That would be very cool. Um, I know you talked about, you know, some of the thematic influences from growing up in the 80s and some of the awesome movies from that time. Uh, is, are there any art movements in particular that inspire you? Or uh, second part of my question is, is there a gaming influence? Are you a gamer by chance? And I ask this because when I would describe this to someone, the first thing that came to mind was um, Silent Hill or Bioshock or things of that nature that have this kind of rustic horror fantasy element yeah so i i love video games but i actually i'm more of like i mean i guess this doesn't really count is that i love animal crossing <laughs> like right now but like i'm more of like a like a platform like um you know like mario brothers type stuff and okay I'm trying to think of what else I've been playing. Yeah, I've been playing just a lot of like indie games. Like right now I just have a Switch. Um, I, I was a pretty big gamer like back in the day, but uh, yeah, I've actually, so the funny thing about all that, like Bioshock, I, I love the imagery, but I get really motion sick for some reason. Like the whole like spinning, like 360, I can't do. So like, I always try to play those games and I just can't. Like I, I literally, it feels like I'm getting car sick, which is right. really weird, but I, I looked it up and other people have that problem. So, um, yeah, I mean, I, I guess I'm more again, like inspired by like, di like movie directors, like number one, definitely Stanley Kubrick. Um, I was like really young when I started watching Kubrick movies, which is we. I'm like, wow! I remember being like four years old and watching like The Shining and like. That's Tuesday. pretty heavy. Yeah, I know. And then I wonder. I'm like, oh, that's what's wrong with me. Um, but like, yeah, like Kubrick, David Lynch. I love David Lynch. Um, Wes Anderson, Tim Burton's like old stuff. Uh, Spielberg. Uh, God, there's so much Terry Gilliam. Terry Gilliam does like a lot of the wide angle type stuff too. So yeah, I, de I definitely get a lot of inspiration from like directors. I just, I, I love movies so much. I know I keep saying it, but. Um, right. Is there any interest in possibly branching out into, into filmmaking? Yeah, definitely. I've been doing music videos on and off for the past few years. And like I had said before, like that was kind of like, like the, what I really wanted to do when I was in high school and kind of, you know, trying to choose like a college and what I was going to do and where I was going to go. So it, it's kind of funny how things come around full circle. So, um, yeah, I definitely, so now that my studio is almost done, um, so I kind of, I have like a space where I build and take down sets 
and then there's like another space where I just did like like the kitchen that's behind me and there's like a bathroom, a bedroom and a living room. So um, I kind of did this to so so other photographers and filmmakers too can like rent it out. But now that you know I've done this, I I want to do like possibly like a short film in this. Um, but yeah, I, I really want to start doing short films um, this year, especially. Awesome. I, I think they'll be incredible based on even just some of the short video clips that you've done accompanying some of these um, photography pieces. Uh, it, it seems like it could be a very long process. What's the creative process for you from like inspiration to the time of execution? Um, so it, it kind of, it varies. It depends. So sometimes I will just grab a friend and be like, Hey, we're going to go out like looking for a place to shoot, whether it's abandoned or we find something in nature and I just kind of go with it. Um, and then there's the places where that's actually up in Northern New Hampshire. It's called the poor farm P O O R E. And, um, it's like kept up as a museum type thing. It's like way up there, like on, like near the Canadian border. But uh, oh, wow. so sometimes I also, I'll like see pictures of a location before I'm there. So I get to kind of like, I do a lot of storyboarding. Um, so I'll kind of, I can't really draw that well, but I'll, I'll just sketch out like stick figures, almost like taking notes. So I, I don't forget to do something um because you know there there is a lot going on in my photos so like if i have a specific idea and i don't write it down my memory is completely horrible so <laughs> I'll, I'll usually like just do the stick figures and write stuff down um just so like while i'm shooting i don't forget to do anything i actually shoot really fast too um because you know I, I spend all the time doing the set design and the lighting typically before the people that I'm taking photos of get there. So usually this is probably going to sound really strange, but like when I do a shoot, it's like 10 minutes. <laughs> I spend like 40 hours, like setting it up or like building something on average. And then it's like, all right, I'm done. Like I got what I needed. Um, but again, it's because like people just literally need to like insert themselves into the set. Um, and I don't need a million photos of the same thing. So, but yeah, um, it, I'm pretty lucky that thing, you know, I get ideas pretty fluently, I guess is the word I would use. Um, I write a lot of stuff down too. And I, I always, I do workshops and I always tell people that I'm like, keep a notebook, not your phone, not any like, you know, like electronic device, like keep an actual notebook where you can scribble and do sketches and cross things out or add things in. Um, and you know, sometimes I, I like, I have notebooks full of ideas that I haven't even like considered doing yet. And sometimes I look back on them and I'm like, what, what is this? What was I thinking? Or I don't even know what it means. It's right. just like three random words. And I'm like, what? I, I, <laughs> but yeah. Um, yeah, I do I, a lot of note taking, a lot of notebooks, um, sketching things out. And uh, yeah. Yeah. Incredible, incredible detail. So it uh, looks like 90% of that is in your impeccable preparation. Um, so, so amazing, amazing stuff. Let's let's jump forward a little bit. How so how did you become exposed to NFTs in the crypto art space? Yeah, so um this is actually funny. So there's this class the I can't say who it is cuz he's like he doesn't want anyone to know who he is, but the person that does this clown called Wrinkles the Clown, there's actually a documentary about him on Hulu. Um he's a friend of mine because he hired me uh, a few years ago to photograph him in the wrinkles, the clown costume. Actually that um, I shot him. That's my friend's attic and um, that's her daughter. And I actually took photos of him with her 
Um, but anyway, he's a good guy, like, in real life, not, you know, with that whole... Oh, yeah, there it is on the on the right. Yep. <laughs> um, so he told me, he had texted me, and he was like, I don't really know what this is. He's like, but you probably want to look up NFTs. He's like, a bunch of artists are talking about it. Um, and he didn't really know much about it. He was kind of just, like, passing it on to me. So I looked it up, and I was like oh, this seems like, and I'm not normally someone to jump on something right away, but um, th this is in like January. And um, so he told me about it. And shortly after that, I had gotten the Clubhouse app and everyone on Clubhouse was talking about it. And that's actually how I learned because I wasn't in a cryptocurrency before that. I... For some reason, I just never had any interest in any of that. So, um, so admittedly, uh, like I've always had not very good luck in the whole gallery circuit. Um, just that and people like, you know, always bartering with me or just always wanting me to work for free or, you know, just, I guess, not feeling appreciated for what I do. It, I mean, it's constantly a struggle, and I, I think all artists feel that way. And um, I, I was at the point where I was, like, burnt out from it. I was tired of it. I had just done, like, a music video for very little money, and I hadn't even gotten paid yet. And I was just like, come on, like, I can't keep doing this, you know? This is getting a little ridiculous, so... When I looked up NFTs, it seemed to me that people were just, you know, it was people that actually appreciated artists and the work they do and the work they put in. And it, to me, like, it looked like the collectors actually cared about the story. And I, I was coming for a, from a place where, like, I'd get comments, like, on my social media of people being like, no one cares about the story. They just care about the outcome. And it's like... Well, like, I care about the story. I like when people ask me about, you know, how I do things or, like, just the story about my travels and doing stuff. And, like, I don't know. So it, it just looked like a really positive environment and everyone seemed, like, super supportive of each other. And I was just like, wow, this seems incredible. Um, again, normally I don't, like, just jump on something right away but it just it seemed right for me and um i'm really glad i it's you know someone on clubhouse like took a bunch of us into a room and like show, showed us how to set up a wallet and how to like mint an nft and um so obviously too like i'm trying to pay it forward with people that are interested in getting in that space but yeah i mean i love it so far um I, I think it's an important place for artists to be for for anyone. I mean, it, it's I feel like the possibilities for just anyone are just endless. Um, you know, like I, I when I talk about it to a lot of people I know, they're like, well, I wish I was creative or I'm not really an artist. And I'm like, eh, th there's people doing stuff in the space that you'd be surprised about, you know, like like real estate stuff and like just right. like you know, it's it's like just yeah I, I can't tell people more to just like look into it you know and right. yeah i'm really glad i did at, at the time i did you know i just i i feel very lucky to have been told about it and to actually pursue it and we talk about this a lot with musicians especially there's been a commoditization of art over the years where you know it should be disposable it should be free is the perception of a lot of people because they can experience it that way and one thing that the you know the tokenization and the crypto art movement has helped do is um talk about the intrinsic value of art and the value proposition there like people buy the artist and the reason and the story just as much as the execution in this space in fact it's very important um so you know that in itself is a worthwhile cause at least for me knowing i'm championing that for for art and something that gets me out of bed and excited about what we do um but i would agree wholeheartedly yeah it's, it's great to see that different approach from people and kind of that renaissance of, of what art is about now don't get me wrong 
there's certainly other, you know, people that have different interests and people that are trying to get involved because they see dollar signs, but mm -hmm. um, definitely being able to, to refocus on what makes art valuable and important. And, and even if it's just having that kind of discussion, it's, it's definitely welcomed. Yeah. Yeah. And it's, especially like me, like if you come, you know, I'm, I was coming from a place where people would actually, you know, resort to slander because I'd give them my rates, you know, like I, I'd have people email me like, Oh, I, I want to work with you. And I'd be like, okay, like, here's my rates. If you have any questions, let me know. And they, they'd freak out. Like, I'm like, where do you think I'm, I'm not, you know, I'm not independently wealthy. Like I, I can't just spend a ton of money on props and, you know, wardrobe and all that. So, um, and it was years and years of that. And I've dealt with a, a lot of really amazing people over the years that, you know, have given me business and have purchased prints and I'm like forever grateful to them. But for every one person like that, there's literally like 50 that, and I, I think a lot of other artists feel the same way. I mean, you see memes all the time about like exposure, like, Oh, I'm going to pay my rent in exposure bucks. You know what right, I right. There, there was this one person that, you know, I did, I gave her my rates and, uh, she was like, Oh no, I, I just wanted to shoot with you for fun. And I was like, well, I, I can't pay, pay my bills with fun. You know? Right. Right. And it's like, I, you know, I, I have people that I know that we do just do stuff like kind of just portfolio stuff or we do it for fun or whatever. Cause that is needed. Like it's not always about the money, but it's like, it's crazy to me like that a stranger like like why don't i just email a plumber and be like hey man like can you <laughs> and do, uh, that would have been good for the mario shoot right <laughs> yeah, exactly i should do that i i yeah. should be like recording myself doing that and see how that goes down but, but yeah it's like man when when i found this space you know the whole nft space and it was the complete opposite of what i've had to struggle with for the past how many years i like you know 15 years it was like a blessing honestly <laughs> right and also you know we haven't even touched really on the other economic impact whereas secondary sales give royalties to you too as well where a lot of you know traditional stuff that would be sold as prints obviously you don't have that same um that same provenance and tracking to be able to make sure that's enforced if it's even part of an agreement um so you know a lot of a lot of cool stuff for supporting artists as well um that can be baked in and that's all part of the smart contract and i know that you like to do some audio visual stuff as well what are your thoughts on kind of the cool possibilities for things with the smart contract that could be executed we have people talking about you know getting programming into some of these pieces so that they change over time or they change relative to the temperature or environment. There's so many cool things that personally, when I start thinking about it, I get, you know, I get a headache because there's so many possibilities, but it also gets me excited because we're really at the forefront of being able to really experiment and do some different things. Yeah. And that's what I've been telling people too, is like, I, it, I feel like there's not many chances in anyone's lifetime that they can be in a space and, you know, be one of the first people to do something or be one of the first people to pioneer something or whatever. And I feel like we're all in a space where it's possible to, you know, do something that hasn't been done before. And I know a lot of people are kind of like cynics about it and every, you know, people like to say, well, everything's been done before. And it's like, well, maybe like not in this space, you know, like it's a new space. And um, yeah, I, th I think there's a lot and not, not that you have to pioneer anything or be the first one to do anything, but um it's certainly kind of amazing that if given the chance, there's people out there that can, and it, yeah, like I, I, I can't even wrap my mind around the possibilities. Like you said, it's it kind of like is headache inducing in a good way, but um, it's also forced me personally to 
again, do things that I wouldn't consider doing or um, like even the collaborations. I, I, I mean, before this, I, I don't know why I would have collaborated with anyone. I mean, I, I, for a long time I was on, I still am. There's a, a and I can't speak highly enough about this site. Um, hitrecord.org. Um, it's Joseph Gordon Levitt's website and it's all about collaborating. And, um, I think that site's been around since like 2010 and I tell everyone about it. I actually, that would be amazing if they somehow incorporated NFTs into their site. Um, cause you know, typically what happens is like for me, I'll upload a picture and someone animates it or someone writes a poem about it or, you know, I upload my video and someone edits it. It's, it's just all about collaborating on the site and they come out with like, yep, that's exactly it. Um, so, you know, other than just kind of uploading stuff to that site, I really didn't collaborate with people much before other than like, I guess like doing music videos would be considered one, but like, in terms of like with my photos, I don't really know, you know, why would I like, I, I, why would I go to an animator and be like, can you animate this? Like for what purpose? And right. So, I mean, yeah, with NFTs, it's like, man, I find myself like reaching out to so many people. I actually, um, I did a collaboration with an animator, uh, Yossi. It's actually on my open sea and, um, yeah, he just animated like one little butterfly in one of my astronaut photos and did kind of like a light beam. And I loved what he did. I just literally handed him over the photo and it was one of those, hey, I know you're good at what you do. I trust your judgment, so let's do this. And um, I, I'm actually right now working with a director that I worked on a music video with and um, so I just gave him like all my material and um, I, I actually got him into the NFT space. I was like, dude, you have to do this because he's just like a, an incredible editor. Um, and yeah, he knows how to do all that stuff. Whereas I I'm, I love shooting the video, but I'm not much of a an editing the video person, which I eventually I'll figure that out. But I mean, yeah, if I can collaborate with people, that's amazing. Like musicians, uh, editors, whatever. Um, right. But yeah, yeah. it's, it's, it's cool how that space kind of like all of a sudden it's like, oh, now you have a reason. Oh yeah, and the video you asked me about, that's the other strange thing is like, I've been just doing little random video clips for years. And the reason why I was doing those was mostly just to show that everything is real, that it's not like computer generated, like, hey, here's a set that I built. This is a real person, like stuff like that. And then I just kind of got into it's funny because I was like doing these like 30 second to 60 second clips. It's probably because of Instagram. I don't even know. Like when I post videos on Instagram, it doesn't really get any engagement. But it's like all these years, I'm like, I don't know what to do with this stuff. And now I'm like, Oh, I can literally now I can I have a place to put these. Yeah, these are perfect for NFTs. Yeah. Perfect. Yeah, the top I mean, yeah, they're like 30 to 60 seconds, so yeah, it's it's just yeah, the space is just so perfect for me. I feel that's I'm so glad I I pursued it. And then um just cuz you mentioned it, the uh hit record you said was um Joseph Gordon Lovett's site. Yeah. And I, I saw that he had actually, was that hit? He brought that photo with him to Jimmy Fallon when that was shown, or was that the beginning yeah, of your so, relationship? No. So I've been posting on that site since like 2015. Um, and he shares my stuff a lot because he, he uses my work a lot for like, they call it like challenges. So like, um, he'll post a photo and be like one of my photos and be like, Oh, like write like a five line story about this or someone animate this or whatever. And, um, I, I mean that, that site is amazing because again, it's, it's hard to find positivity on the internet. <laughs> like, I feel like he should win a Nobel peace prize for that site just cause like every, there's no negativity whatsoever. Um, 
and it's just yeah it's such a good community to be in and um but yeah the jimmy fallon thing uh so what happened is he had actually posted one of my astronaut photos and he was looking for people i think in malaysia to write a photo about it i mean to write a poem about it um because they do stuff in like different languages too yeah so um when he was going to be on the show, they contacted me and they were like, Hey, we're thinking of like switching it up and like doing the challenge on him. So that's what they did. They like, which that was really cool. Um, and it was so bizarre though, that of course, like it's during COVID. So it was like that weird, like split screen thing going right. on where like, cause he obviously like wasn't in the studio there, but um, yeah, that was really cool. That happened, I think, la uh, August of 2020. So right, and he said, "What do you think the uh, the astronauts thinking?" Right. Yes, and that right. and that was his original post. Is hey, like people in Malaysia write like a poem about what the astronaut is thinking. So that's why the Jimmy Fallon show did that with him. They kind of like switched up the challenge to to fall back on him, which was pretty cool that was that was very cool thank you for sharing that that story um so we were taking a look at um your foundation page here and your open sea as well is there anywhere else we should definitely go grab a look at different nfts you have posted um i think you already went on my foundation yeah so i'm on foundation open sea i'm on known origin but haven't made a drop yet Okay. And yeah, that, I, that's I saw that. I didn't know if you had an issue, and you yanked it off. No. no, no. Okay. I'm, uh, yeah. So that my director friend, his name's Don Tyler. That's who I'm actually working with. Um, we're doing like a, a big drop with like I, I just went to these president heads in uh, Virginia, not this past weekend, the weekend before. So like I just went, and um, yeah, that middle picture right there. And I did like a bunch of like panning, like drone shots. And so I think what we're gonna do is like, do like, yeah, like a 30 second video. And he's probably gonna animate the original photo and then probably drop just the original photo as well. So probably like do like three different drops in one, I guess. Very um, cool. But yeah, so I that'll probably happen within the next couple of weeks as he's actually working on it right now. That place was cool. Also, the sculptor who did that, whose name is evading me right now, he made a whole... So there's like 42 presidents, I think he did. He did them all the way up to like 2008. Um, and he's going to make... I, I think he's trying to do it current, but... um. He made like a whole other set. Those they're like the size of houses, by the way. Like the wow. height of them. They're huge. And he made a whole other set in Austin, Texas. Like I couldn't believe it. I was like, who makes another set of these giant things? Right. <laughs> it looks also, like it's the relics that have been there from like ancient times or something, right? Yeah, I so yeah, it's funny. He I, I was reading into it. I think he finished those in like 2008 and they were supposed to go in like this big park and it just like never happened or some kind of like amusement park or something um so they're kind of like if anyone google searches president's heads uh in virginia you can actually see they like do events where you can just go there and like take pictures and stuff um but yeah, it, it's very strange. <laughs> I was very like, cool. Why is there two sets made? He had also made like the Beatles, but the, the, so they're that size, but it's full bodies. If you can imagine that, it's Wait, it's wow. Crazy. Yeah, and they have like instruments and thing stuff. It's yeah, it's crazy. Definitely, definitely cool. We'll have to keep our eyes on Known Origin for that drop for sure. Yeah. Um, I wanted to ask you a couple questions as someone that's recently come in. What do you feel are some of the biggest challenges for new people coming into the space? Um, I think that there's just so, so it's funny because now that I've been in the space, um, I find my, I remember how I was when I was first trying to enter it. And like, it's like, oh my God, people are talking about gas and ETH 
And, you know, it's all words that like, if you're not into any of that at all, it's another language. Right. And if you're into it, it's not a big deal. It's literally the, the simplest thing, which now I feel that way. Like there's some things that catch me for a loop, but like, you know, like I accidentally transferred wrapped ETH to my ETH wallet thinking they would <laughs> talk to each other, not knowing I would just lose that. Um, so that sucked, <laughs> but it was a learning experience. But like, yeah, I think the biggest issue, and someone was talking about this last night too, especially like with Clubhouse, is just being so far removed from all of it and not knowing you know again it's like when when you don't even know what to ask because you don't know anything about what's going on you don't know what to ask you don't know the wording of stuff you don't know where to look so i think just like the education part of it is the hardest thing but um i feel like yeah like with clubhouse um i know i don't know if he's still in here like lavelli was in here and i know he has a discord where um i think like weekly i want to say they do it weekly they like go through on their discord like here's how you set up a wallet and this what this is what this is and um <clears throat> i think like having people like that in the community just to help people out with the basics because we got to remember like especially you know with me like i started from like ground zero like i had no clue what was going on so yeah i think it's just like the education part and where these people can find the people that are willing to help out and you know where they can go for information and things like that but i mean i think once once most people have someone explaining everything step by step um and kind of just like educating themselves beyond that um you know and just kind of staying like in the game um again like i i use clubhouse as a podcast Kind of like an interactive podcast so i'll just like sit in a room while i'm working on something at my studio and just absorb everything because there is a lot i don't know so it's yeah it's important to seek out people that can help you with the basic step by step but it's also important to also keep learning about it and be educated about what people are doing and like where everything's going and um yeah and, and to also be able to speak to it to people that you know i think as an artist i think it's important to try to bring collectors in on it too um and i think that's even what i struggle with right now is most of the, most of the people that you know collect my physical work are not in the nft world at all and i i feel like it's kind of like all of our duties to try to at least bring a percentage um of our collectors into that world um, right and it's not for everyone i get that but um yeah the the sharing of the knowledge i think is very important so yeah i'd say that's probably the the hardest thing and i i think once people get over that and they you know they set up their wallet and they kind of know like the the language and what stuff means that um yeah i think it's pretty straightforward from there yeah and uh you know i don't know if you've been in the whale community before but we are the largest um community for the nft space uh on discord on social media outside of clubhouse which is kind of a different animal but we're kind of an amalgamation of collectors and enthusiasts and artists and new people so it's a cool mix of really tenured people sharing what they know and you seeing that along with people trying to find their way people trying to find art to buy um so it's a good mix well what you definitely don't want is to just you know i always caution people if you get into an environment where you're learning a lot just try to have a lens of understanding where the people that are sharing with you are getting this information from and and, and just try to seek out some different sources to make sure things are well-rounded as far as you know what you're hearing and, and what you're what you're getting um one thing we definitely don't want is to be an insular community right like you said we have to onboard new people so we have cool things like nifty gateway like nba top shot where people participate and get into the ecosystem without even realizing it 
They're like, this is cool. Let me, let me whip out my credit card and buy it. Right. And so they get involved without having to deal with the wallets and things of that nature. And later on, we find people in our communities all the time. Like, Hey, I came here cause I bought a LeBron on top shot or, you know, I, I saw a cool people and I saw the name on nifty gateway and jumped in now. Now they have three ETH wallets and, you know, who knows what they got going on over there. Some sketchy stuff, but they're now involved and, uh, you know, they're part of our ecosystem. So that's great. But you're right. We have to continue to onboard other people and collectors because we don't want to be just, you know, collecting each other. We don't want to be that group of uh, musicians at a show that are just the other bands, bands in the right. audience, right? Mm -hmm. um, so, so I'm glad that you mentioned that and that you saw that. One thing I did want to ask you, and I, I don't know if this was um, something you've encountered more than once, but I, I saw something on your Twitter. I think you made mention of of people on Clubhouse running rooms, and I believe it was an NFT room and something relative to photography, kind of giving you a hard time or 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 maybe treating you differently because you were a woman. And I've been kind of asking people to try to give a platform and just understand, you know, is there any biases is there more attention that needs to be paid to gatekeeping in this space is there something we, we need to make sure we're paying mind to so that we have the best representation out there yeah um yeah that specific incident really upset me and actually the i never i'm not into like naming names and um the the person that did it actually ended up messaging me i don't even know how they saw that I admit because they weren't following me. I think everyone was like, ooh, like you might wanna, uh, cause it was bad. Um, so someone was asking in a room, um, it was a new person to, to NFTs and it was, I believe it was a, they, it was just like a standard NFT room, but it was someone asking about photography. And um, they were like, I don't know if it's like a space for that. Um, which is funny because when I first started, I, I was I thought it was just for like all, you know, just like digital rendering as well. So, you know, I just I was like, hey, you know, I'm a photographer myself and I've had a lot of luck. And yes, absolutely. And like I didn't even get to finish and this this person just like cut me off. And then they were like it was just very disrespectful. And um it's it's hard when yeah the gatekeeping like i'm kind of like a wallflower like i'm not like when i'm in a room of people whether it's a virtual room or in real life um i'm not the loudest i'm not kind of stepping on people's toes to get noticed i either someone notices me or they don't or they want to engage with me or they don't um so but it, it's frustrating to me you know when i when i try and I try in like a civil way just to like, you know, put my stuff out there, like just engage with people and it's, it's shot down. I don't know why, like I, sometimes I'm like, oh, is it the sound of my voice? Like I know I have a monotone voice and it's, it, it's hard to the, you know, being a female because it's like people say they support females, but then I had seen this meme a couple weeks ago and I was like, yes. And it was something about like, Supporting females means supporting females that you're also just not attracted to, you know what I mean? And it's like, I think that's, that's huge. Um, and a lot of people don't say it, but I, I grew up with that a lot. I actually, um, I've always been, found myself in a lot of male dominated, um, situations. Like, um, again, I'm an eighties kid and I played hockey for a good portion of my life. And like back then, like I was usually the only girl on the team. So I dealt with that very early. Um, so it's like very triggering to me when someone, you know, pulls that. And uh, yeah, it's um, I, I it's, it's hard. The, the gatekeeping is frustrating because like I said, I've never had luck in the whole gallery circuit. Not that much. And I don't know why, and it's it's very frustrating for me. And again, like I know my work isn't for everyone. I know it doesn't have a place everywhere, but like I, I've really struggled with that. And um, you know, whether it's because I'm female, I, I don't know. I don't even know the reasoning. Um, but it's it's yeah, the gatekeeping is frustrating because 
is, you know, with the NFT space, it's like, it's like here we have um, almost like a clean slate to art, I feel, where there's so much possibilities for being positive and all inclusive. And it's like, oh, no, the, <laughs> the, the evil little fingers of the, the same crap that, you know, a lot of us have been dealing with in the physical world is starting to kind of like rear its ugly head and it's it's frustrating you know and it's even the fact that people you know they say they support this person and they say they support that person but they'll they'll always you know again on something like clubhouse they'll always go into the rooms that are beneficial to them but not so much supportive to other people so it's like they'd rather go into a room that has maybe a celebrity in it or like a a very well-known artist than than go to a room with like 30 people to support that person and i i think it's important to show up like you said the thing about the bands before and yeah you don't want to be playing to just other bands but going on that reference as well it's like when when and i've never been in a band but i did a lot in the music industry in terms of like photography and stuff and it's like no one likes that band that plays their set and leaves you know right. now, yeah yeah you know it's you go stick around and watch the other bands and i uh, even like you know when you have the headlining band and you see them standing there watching the the local opener that says a lot Oh, my light just shut off. Um, that says a lot about people and about, you know, just who they are as a person and what they have to um, kind of give to the community. Yeah, 100%. Um, you definitely do not want to be that band. But like you said, you also want to bring other people into the door. And thank you for sharing some of your, your thoughts and your experiences on that. Um, it's something that I've seen, you know, mentioned uh, by a couple of people recently, and we want to make sure we have those conversations and and work through that. One thing I'll caveat that in saying is uh, the the NFT community has been here for a while, um, a couple of years, and the community on Clubhouse is relatively new. Mm -hmm. And there's a lot of discussion about it being a bridge, so to speak, to some of the mainstream, which is good. I mean, that brings in a lot of new people, exposure, they're able to participate and take part in the ecosystem but there's also a learning curve there as far as culturally what this has traditionally been and so i guess what i'm saying is you can't just look at one facet of the community and, and, and characterize the whole thing i would welcome you to spend some time with us here in whale um as well as some of the other great places token smart and uh and you know get a holistic view of of kind of what this has been and mm -hmm. i'll i'll preface this by saying unconscious bias exists I have to acknowledge that, right? I, I want to say, hey, I'm super supportive. I'm I'm in mass. I'm in the bastion of liberalism here in Massachusetts, and all these other things. I support everybody, but that's the whole point of unconscious bias. I may not realize it, but one thing I think is really, really neat about this culture of this scene and this art movement is. Um, I find myself more and more disassociating from whatever the social construct is of people, their sexual orientation, their gender, their height, their size, any of this. And more so the important thing, because I'm in it all day, is their their little avatar and their personality that they put in through their discussions and what their work or their artwork or what they present themselves in their wallet. That's what's resonating with me as the characteristics of someone. And so I'm not even, it's not even registering to me sometimes all of these other factors. And that's one of the beauties of the metaverse and kind of what we have here. And I, I, I think that's a cool aspect of it. And hopefully we can preserve that mm -hmm. and um, have these discussions and weed out uh, some of these negative things. But if we see them, let's talk about them and make sure we set them right. So thank you for being a voice for that. That's, that's big. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, I, like you said, I definitely, I hope more people have conversations around it and just, you know, inclusivity is huge, you know, but yeah, you can talk about it, but you have to actually do it right. <laughs> and know it, you know? Yep, for sure. For sure. So with that being said, with your experiences and, and what you've gotten going so far, um, you talked about paying it forward. What advice would you give to a new photographer specifically trying to come into the space? 
Oh, um, I remember it's funny because I have no concept of time right now. It's I, I, it feels like I've been, you know, in this, in this whole NFT world for a while, but it's, a, it's only been like, I think mid January, I think maybe I minted my first piece in like mid February or something. But I remember when I first kind of looked into it and I, uh, there was a few people that made it just with their comments or what they were saying. Um, I almost didn't pursue it because again, I having looked at what, what was already out there and then hearing people saying like, Oh no, you gotta like, you have to animate your stuff. Like, man, I remember I, I was in a, it was in a room and some amazing painter was asking about NFTs and some guy was like, oh, no, no, no. He's like, e you're going to have to edit that or make it 3D or something. And if you can do that, that's cool. Um, I think it's cool that the space allows for, um, that the space allows for, you know, kind of bringing like, maybe you have old work that you want to bring to life in a different way or do something different with. Um, and that, that's totally cool. I've done it, but I've also uploaded just static images. Um, you know, which is how <clears throat> my, my photos were supposed to be presented originally. And I've done well with those too. So I, I would say, and I bet I try to say this to everyone is there's a space for everyone. You know, it's, you don't have to do this. You don't have to do this. Can you do different things? Yeah, absolutely. But, um, you know, in terms of like animating your, your work, that's, you know, any kind of traditional work or putting music to it. But, um, yeah, I, I, I just, I hope people see, like, know that that message exists first before maybe hearing misinformation or hearing what supposedly people prefer. It's that, you know, supposedly, they prefer moving images or they prefer this or that. It's like, you know, just, just by doing my research and kind of like looking around on all these sites again, like there's, there's so much different artwork. And then at the end of the day, yeah, like all kind of art is accepted just like, just like any other platform. So, um, I think it's important that people know that message and know it right away so they they don't kind of get derailed and don't further look into entering that space. Awesome advice. Awesome advice. Uh, I'm sorry I've kept you so long chatting your ear off, but it's such a fascinating um, discussion. And, um, you know, I was so excited to have this talk. Um, but I want to make sure we get to some of the questions and comments from the audience mm -hmm. that I had seen. Um, someone had asked, do you set out seeking to highlight a specific thing in each photograph? Or is it just kind of a vibe and you see what, you know, what's happening there on the spot? Um, yeah, it's... um. I'm not good at the, yeah, the, the, what does it mean type stuff. Um, and I always say like, not, none of my photos are supposed to have a specific meaning to me. The best thing that can happen is if a viewer can think of a meaning for themselves. Um, you know, cause there, there's a difference between looking at a piece of artwork and just being like, oh, yep, okay, this is cool. And you keep walking if it's in person or you keep scrolling if it's on your phone, whatever. But it's another thing to kind of like stop and look at it. And it makes you think and you and you think of a backstory in your head. And again, I, I kind of go for that feeling of maybe this is a still from a movie and something happened prior to this one shot and something's going to happen after it. Um, or maybe it just reminds people of something in their life or just anything. I, I think if people sit with the imagery for a little while and don't just kind of discard it and go past it, um, that, that to me is what I, I always look for. Um, I mean, that's what I want. Um, and again, like I, I realize my stuff isn't for anyone 
usually people are just uncomfortable or like, I mean, that's happened to me or especially when I vend at stuff like in person. Um, cause it's funny how people like don't really keep their, their comments to themselves or they don't, it's like, Oh wow, I'm sitting right here. But like, right. I'll, always hear, I'll always hear people be like, no, no, no. Or like, that's, that's too unsettling or whatever. And it's like, okay, whatever. That's fine. I mean, still, I got an emotion out of them, I guess, which is still kind of cool, but yeah, I, I just kind of like to do it. Yeah. It's the vibe more. I just kind of like to do it. I do what I feel. Um, even when I make a lot of my sets, I just, even, you know, I, like I said, I storyboard stuff, but it's a lot of just doing it in the moment, not a lot of thinking and a lot of just doing, um, like a, like a fluid thing. So, um, yeah. And it's like, as, as I'm doing it, it's just creating its own environment and own kind of story. So yeah. Very, very cool. Um, a couple of cool comments I wanted to share. Someone said that your art makes them want to attend a theater, which is appropriate, right? Gonna that's, see that's the movie. A, yeah, that's, yeah. The movie inspiration there. Yeah. Um, someone says, uh, looking at your, your photography is like bringing fantasy characters to reality. I would agree with that wholeheartedly. Um, and uh, actually, someone said that it's very cool, and they think it's awesome that you've allowed freestyle collaboration on that hit record platform. Yeah, yeah. I, I mean, I, I trust that platform too. I really haven't. The only I've never run into any issues from people maybe like downloading or whatever from that platform. Usually, it's just people that you know, just screenshot my stuff and decide to use it for God knows what, which I find that all the time. And I, you know, I'll just send a takedown notice because, you know, again, like as much as I do want to get compensated for my work, you know, if anyone wants to use my images for something like have a, and this goes for any artist or whatever, have a conversation with me first, you know? Just like right. don't take my stuff and use it for an album cover. <laughs> like, and it, it's shocking to me. Like, people do that and they think they can't get caught. And it's like, man, there's technology where like I can search this image. So it's right. like when I catch people, they're always like, oh my God. I did. It's like, yeah, dude, it's, <laughs> <laughs> not, it's technology exists. They're always right. like, shocked. Right. They should have just taken the, the b-boy pose in front of a chain link fence or something and kept yeah, it exactly it did not early no, 90s basic yeah no instead it's always the astronaut photos like like soundcloud it's like most of the albums is like <laughs> i can totally see that yes mine i'm just like come on man like just right. ask me or like i didn't i didn't know how to find who did this and i'm like what you find who did it by doing what I just did to find my own image. You just search it and you'll see my name. Like it's crazy, but yeah, right. I've never had issues on that site and it, it's cool to see what people do, um, with my photos and yeah. Someone had asked, would you take any of these characters to live events, burner events or Rubel Rubulad? I don't know what that is, but uh, live events. Would you take any of these characters? That would be cool. So actually, like I, I was thinking like some of the things that people do at Burning Man are crazy. Like so, I was like, man, like that would be cool if I could do a set, you know? Because I, for a while, I was doing like pop up sets, like not just at my studio. Like I would like do them in like Los Angeles or New York City. And that would be amazing. Not so much, I think, the characters, but if I could actually, like, build, like, some sort of, like, interactive photo booth or something, like, I, like I've like i done in the past, um, I would love to do that, actually. Very cool. And then, um, this is a good one relative to our earlier conversation. Someone asked, have you encountered other artists who are reluctant to be associated with the NFT space? even if they're doing digital work already or whatever, how would you talk to them and persuade them to jump in that it's a positive thing? Oh, um, I mean, I guess it has to do with their history and how they're doing. I mean, 
with me, it's like I was doing the same thing over and over and over again. I just felt like it wasn't work. I mean, it was working to a certain extent, but um, like I said, I just felt like I wasn't being respected for the time I was putting in, um, just a lot of things. So I, I guess that's kind of a, kind of a path I would go down, I guess, is just kind of see presently how they're doing, you know, are they, are, is that their only job? Are they like a full-time artist? Are they looking to expand? Are they looking to do more? Um, but like just talking about it to people and getting excited about it. Um, I think that's really important. I, I try to post on social media as much as I can too. Um, and I feel like people know that I'm really happy to be in that space and I'm really excited about it. And when you, when you portray that, it makes people ask questions and it makes people want to know, you know, how can they feel that way? How can they, you know, branch out and do something different like that. So, I mean, I know there's some people again, where it's just not, not for them. Um, but yeah, I mean, I, I, I don't, it's, yeah, it's hard. I, I, I've hit that roadblock where I tell people about it and they're just not interested. And I, I've actually been asking around to see how people kind of go over that, that speed bump or if they get over it at all. And I haven't, I haven't really gotten many answers that I'm trying to like compile a list of how to go about it with people. Um, and I'm sort of, I guess in the beginning stages of that, but I, I would love to, I would love to hear what other people say or do to other artists or even, like I said, collectors, um, yeah, of how you know the people that are dead set against it, how people are changing their minds. I guess um, I would love to know that because yeah, I'd, I'd love to have those those tools available in my toolbox so when I need them, I can use them. It sounds like you're well on your way to becoming a champion of the space and definitely one of the most uh, revered and talented photographers that are involved with it. Karen, thank you so much for joining us today and allowing me to take so much of your time. I'm sure my uh, people helping me with the stream are uh, are are wondering um, how much more I have for you. And quite honestly, I could have you on for another show. Would you be open to down the road when you had another drop coming back and sharing more with us? Yes, of course. Absolutely. I would love to. Awesome. This has been a fantastic conversation uh, with your socials. We'll share them all uh, within our community and on the post, your, your, um, your Instagram, your Facebook, your Twitter, your foundation, your open sea. What would be the best place for people to stay front and center on what you have going on? The, the most updated spot to see what's going on with you. Um, I think either like Twitter or Instagram. I've been using Twitter much more lately, so probably Twitter, I would say. Okay, great. So we will post that for everybody. I'm sure um, a lot of people will be visiting your socials and you'll see your follower count going up. Uh, Karen, it has been an absolute pleasure. Thank you so much for joining us today. Yeah, thank you so much. I appreciate it. You have a good one. You too. Thank you.